This episode of TWIP is all about copyrights and copy wrongs. It's coming your way next. This is TWIP. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. I'm here today with two of my friends. We're going to be discussing a topic that has been under my fingernails and I think is under a lot of our fingernails recently, and that's the issue of theft, copyright, and otherwise having idiots co-opt your work <laughs> into theirs in one way, shape, or another, whether it be the pixels, whether it be the website, whether it be the location you're shooting at, stuff like that, where, where people that haven't done the work take over your work, stand on your, on your shoulders to reap the benefits. So joining me today to talk about this topic or these topics are Jake Hicks. What's up, Jake Hicks? How you doing, man? Yeah, good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you, man. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. We'll, we'll dive into some of the stuff that you're involved in in a second. But also next to me on the other side is Troy Miller. Troy Miller is a familiar face on This Week in Photo. Hey, Troy, what's going on? Just hanging out. Any anytime I can be here with you, buddy, it's it's all fun. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I wish my computer had that same attitude. <laughs> I got a new hat. I got a new hat just just for the this recording. Look at that. Look at that. You know, covering up that those that luscious long those long locks like Jacob. <laughs> I used to have I used to have hair like that. I used to I if anybody remembers Yanni, right? Like I, I used to have Yanni hair, like big giant mane, and then I turned like forty five and it went Oh no, we're done. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm staring down the barrel. I'm hanging on to it for just a few more years. Yeah, keep it as long as you can, man. You yeah. know, I'm I'm happy with this. I've been doing this for a decade or more. It's just <laughs> boom, done. You know. So, well, cool. Before we dive into it, uh, Jake, I want you to I want to give you a chance. You're, this is your first time on this week in photo, right? So I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience and tell us about some of the projects that uh, that you're working on right now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I've been yeah I've been shooting for about ten fifteen years, I suppose, commercially uh, based out of London, England. Fashion editorial shooter, uh, specialize in a lot of studio work. I don't really shoot outside, and I suppose my style is known for being quite bright and colourful, using a lot of coloured lighting. Yeah, like that's it. Come on, it, it, there's more to you than just that. <laughs> You're so humble uh, with that cool English it? accent. <laughs> Yeah, that's all I do. I just, you know, there's some colored gels here and there, and that's it. You're right, got a few on. tutorials, you know. Yeah, go on. You're you're the yeah, man. Yeah. So yeah. So, so recently, we just we just wrapped on. Well, just just released, in fact, yeah, a brand new tutorial using uh, long exposure lighting in the studio. Yeah. Uh, that's been a long time coming. We've been working on that for a long, long time, and did that with RGG Edu. I did a video with them a couple of years ago, which was on just using gelled um, lighting with portraits. And then this, this one is targeted on long exposure in, in the studio as well, which was, uh, which, is, uh, which was a fascinating project to work on because I think long exposure is something that we sort of all know what it is. We all have the ability to play with it on our camera. Like we've all, you know, done blurred, you know, light trails and that sort of stuff, but we really don't take it much further than that. And I think this this um, tutorial is how can we take that basic principle and extrapolate it all the way up to being able to be a bit more consistent with it and actually use something that's professional looking and commercial. You know, you can you can do something that looks unique, but also, you know, have it commercially viable. Love it. Love it. See, that's more like it. That's 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 the self promotion I'm accustomed to. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of self-promotion, <laughs> Troy Miller, man. <laughs> I, I can't follow that. Like, uh, you know. <laughs> I think you can. Sure you can. <laughs> so what's, on, what's going on with you, man, real quick before we dive into I, the topic? You know, I'm just uh, I'm working on planning our next event, the next F64 Live event in February. So that's been a big deal. Um, I am thoroughly convinced and believe now that shooting a wedding for 12 hours is easier than taking six months and planning an event. It's, it, it is, it is overwhelming, but I'm doing that. Um, and you know, teaching where I can and, you know, fun stuff like that. I'm into pottery. So now I'm making you a bunch of really cool mugs. That's right. We're getting some, yeah. we're getting some black and red, hopefully. I don't know what they're going to yeah. look like, but black and wet red <laughs> this week in photo mugs so I can right, use on set. Yeah. No handles. Yeah. We didn't do handles. Oh, no handles. Okay. So <laughs> no. <laughs> just, just an ashtray then. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so, so before we dive in, Troy, uh, it, it, I was thinking about those mugs because I was looking through the show notes. You put something in there about that. But the uh, I was watching this YouTube review about your mug. And, and you have, do you still have that electronic Starbucks $80 mug that keeps your oh, beverage at a particular temperature? <laughs> Oh, it just happens to be there. <laughs> it's, he uses it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I was watching that. I was like, you know what? We've gone too it far, would, humans. <laughs> it would need to be amazing for that price. It better be. It better be. You know, that's like the salary that some people, like, the money that be, some people have been on money for an entire six months on that one cup. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop. You up for sushi, it costs more than this mug. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, guys, let's dive into the topic, and that that is uh, plagiarism and, you know, or in other words, maybe not just plagiarism, but also the idea of, of having other people co-opt your work and make it their own, whether it be, you know, just a simple screen capture from your website and then building their own gallery or... You know, them looking at the places where you do your engagement shoots if you're a wedding shooter like Troy and then them going to the same spots that you kind of hunted down and now they're now they're there shooting them and sort of selling the place and then um, thirdly it's theft, it's theft. that's it's the only theft. word for it it's yeah theft. yeah well then the third one is also I wanted to dive into is just the, the idea like we're on the internet and everything is templatized especially with with websites you know back in the day it was you had to find a web designer or you had to learn HTML programming and and figure it out yourself and create a web presence. These days, we have services like Squarespace, Format, uh, and WordPress that are templatized that allow you to basically pick an off-the-rack sort of look for your site and then configure it and then make it your own. The issue that I wanted to raise in the context of this show is that people that look at what you're doing and wholesale copy your configuration over to theirs, you know, thereby jumping over all the hoops that you went to to kind of figure out how you wanted to do your show or do your website. And then also the, uh, you know, if they, you know, sort of co-opt the way your logo looks and all that stuff, you know, and Jake, I know you've had some experience with that. What are your, you know, just sort of a 30,000 foot look at this. What are your thoughts on, you know, sort of the overall world of co-opting and embracing and extending others work? Yeah, like I said before, I mean, you know, uh, we can we can dress it up in long words, but it, it's, essentially it is just theft um, <laughs> yeah. and people who are, you know, stealing your images uh, and if they're stealing them to profit for themselves, then that, that becomes an issue. So, for example, if somebody was just using one of my images um, from a journalistic point of view on their blog or something like that, and they were just talking about gelled lighting in general, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I don't have a problem with that. It, but if somebody is taking my work to profit from it, then for me, that's where the the line is firmly drawn. So if they're using it as a portfolio piece, you know, on their own site, or if they're printing it on t-shirts or mugs or whatever it is, then if they're profiting from it, then yeah, that's, that's theft. And I certainly have an issue with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, drawing, drawing the line at profit, I mean, that, that obviously, you know, they're taking money out of your pocket, but the other side of it is if they are, it's selling your your reputation your reputation and sort of not so much dragging your name through the mud but but taking a look like you like you said you know you've crafted finally crafted this look of using color gels on people and it looks it's distinctively yours if someone now starts doing that or taking your work and passing it off as their own they're going to like hey you know it kind of it kind of drags you through the mud a little bit in terms of all the work you did for that look right it's, this is true, but uh, I mean, I don't necessarily have a major issue with people copying me. I have more of an issue. I mean, there are people out there who who, um, who their their tagline that they're making money from is um, get photographs in the Jake Hicks style. Like mm -hmm. they're not even attempting to change it. They are profiting from from that. They are literally advertising. You know, I can take photographs for you in, in the Jake Hicks style, oh, wow. which I find puzzling, which is just puzzling as to why you wow. wouldn't, like why you wouldn't try and own that in any way. You know, it's just so, <sighs> so blatant. I, and, and like I said, I don't have an issue with, with people, you know, copying and, and uh, being inspired. I think 
is the um, technical term by by your work. But um, yeah, but if they're just using your name directly, then yeah, that, that becomes a little bit yeah. The, the J Hicks have, style. Have some, it's like going to a, it's like going to a restaurant and saying, yeah, we, this is this is Bo- Joe Bob's restaurant, but our our food is in the style of Wolfgang Puck. <laughs> well, that that would be like going to a not Coach Bags. Store, yeah. right? But they all coach, look like coach, coach spelled with a K, right? <laughs> right. Oh, I mean, see, I I would question uh, the client that is willing to hire somebody to do something that's li- that's a style of some, another photographer. They you know they they would either prefer to have or can't quite get to you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and would that would that client be yours if that guy didn't exist and do that? Right. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think there are two tiers. Um, uh, well, there's several tiers, but yeah, I would say that there are people who can perhaps afford what we do and we charge accordingly because we've spent decades getting to where we are and that comes at a price and we should charge for that. Um, and at the same time, there are people who, uh, you know, are just copying as it were. And it, I mean, it's never going to be the same. And I would argue it's never going to be the same quality um, because you can't shortcut that level yeah. of experience and therefore they're going to charge a lot less. So are they stealing money out of my pocket? I don't think so, but I do think they are perhaps muddying the name a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you guys think end, do you think end users care about this? I mean, we're like in our world, you know, content creators, photographers, artisans, artists, whatever you want to call us, you know, in our world, in a peer to peer standpoint, we're like, yeah, look at this guy. Your work looks like Jake's work. You're your slime or, you know, I saw that background that you used in some of Troy Miller's shots. You know, you're just copying. Mm. So that's it's sort of a an industry insider feel. But what about the, the customers on the end? Do you think they care? You know, if they, if, uh, you know, I'll throw it to you first, Troy. If someone, if someone knows your work and they're like, oh my God, Troy, if I could get him to do my wedding, that would be fantastic, but I can't afford him. But this guy over here is copying him. <laughs> so why don't, why don't I hire Joe Bob at 25% of the price? He's going to use the same locations as Troy does and he's using the same camera. What's the difference? Like, what, what would you say to those people? Um, the difference is me. Yeah. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same experience. It's not going to be the same quality. And if you're copying me, you're copying what I've already done, not what I'm doing. Yeah. So, yes, it's annoying, but I can't stop it. So I'm not I, – I can't really do anything about it, right? Like I go to a location and I photograph a certain way. There's a, a local uh, facility that I work at. I photographed a bride with a really long cathedral veil. Mm-hmm. flowing behind her that image hangs in their in their lobby and has sold more cathedral veils than any image i've ever seen nice and and you know they tell me the coordinators tell me like oh yeah the other photographers always try to go get that shot but they don't know how to do it and i am i am actually i think that it actually helps me to have other photographers do a poor copy of my work because then when I go out and do it or when they actually look at me, they're like, oh, I want the, I want the actual coach bag. Mm-hmm. I actually want to hire Jake Hicks. Like how do I get to that person? That's my client. And that's the person that's going to, one, respect my art. They're going to be really easy for me to work with. They're not going to quabble about price, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. you know. So not that the invitation or the, the, the people out there doing that are helping my business – but in a way, it's not actually hurting me. It's helping me set myself apart. Interesting. Kind of. And, and do, you, do you agree with that? You know, because if you, if you switch gears away from photography, right, and people stealing your work, which is an obvious sort of thing, and you move over to you're an educator, you're a content creator, you create digital courses, you sell them through rggedu.com. You sure. know, yeah. um, if someone says, you know what, look, that, that colored gel course that Jake did is selling like hotcakes. I'm going to do the exact same thing. And they do the exact same thing. They follow your outline. <laughs> they record the whole thing. All you get is the sale from them from buying your course for research. But, you know, they're, they're essentially stealing your flow. What do you say to that? I mean, like Troy, Troy would say that's flattery and you just go and do something better. Do you agree with that? Or is there, is there any recourse to that? I think there's a, I think there's a level of client education that needs to go on there. I think that a lot of clients, perhaps when they 
I order a photo shoot, if you like, or, you know, book a wedding or something like that. It's, it's, it's not a binary choice. If I have a leaking pipe at home, I, I, you know, get a plumber to come in and that pipe is either fixed or it's not fixed. There's right. a, there's a binary result there. It's a commodity. With yeah. photography. Yeah, exactly. With photography, I think clients some, can sometimes fall into the same trap of thinking somebody's going to photograph my wedding. This guy's going to deliver it for this price. And this guy over here is going to deliver it for this price. Sometimes they, they just can't see the difference. And that may sound odd to us as professional photographers, but I think to certain clients, it, it is a case of education. And yeah, you're right. There are people who, as soon as I release a workshop, you know, two months later or a month later, they're, they're, they're copying it exactly and selling it for half the price. Mm -hmm. And it's it, like, you can't stop that. You don't, I don't own the rights to a, to a lighting style or anything like that. I can't stop them from, from, from doing that. Um, which is very frustrating, but at, at the same time, and I think what Troy was uh, alluding to there is the fact that as soon as I release something like that, I'm working on the next project. I'm working yeah. on the next set of lighting styles. I'm working on the next, you know, techniques and ideas and concepts. And, and you just got to keep moving forward the whole time. You, you, I mean, my philosophy is you can't really look back. You just got to keep concentrating on making fresh images, not worrying about the old. I agree. Ones. I agree. And then, and then, you know, stay positive. And we, we were talking before previously, uh, when we recorded this episode last night, we're redoing this now. People. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is dedication. This is what the real people do. They do podcasting. Um, but when we were talking yesterday, um, Troy, I think part of the 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 gist of what you were saying was take the high road. You know, keep keep rotating your shield frequencies, <laughs> right? Right. So that so that people are always on their heels, and the people that are trying to copy you are maybe copying a past version of you and you're always moving forward. Explain that a little bit, you know, and what, what do you, what's the mindset behind that? Because the, 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 why I want you to explain that is because, yeah, that sounds good when you articulate it, but human nature is, you know, Hey, I've been wronged. I must write that wrong right, <laughs> before right, right. I must balance the universe before all can be right in the universe. Not just, you know what? I'm just going to let that go. What, what do you say? Um, well, first off, is is we need to make we need to make an effort to protect our brand, to protect our work. I, I'm not saying that we don't do that, you know. And there's times, there's things that we go after. There's you send letters, cease and desist letters. You make phone calls. You educate clients. You educate consumers. I educate locations. I educate coordinators uh, about insurance and you know things like that. So I, you make an effort mm -hmm. at some point you you decide how much effort do I make, right? So if someone were to steal one of Jake's images and uh, it was on, on a cover of a book and they sold a million copies, he doesn't just go, well, that's my work and that makes me look good. No, 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 that's <laughs> that's litigation point, right? Yeah, like you go after yeah. that. If yeah. they put it in a blog, maybe you comment on the blog, hey, thanks for using my image. You know, I, that's that's really cool. Um, so that's, that seems that's very weird. passive aggressive. See, I, I would, I wouldn't go to the blog and say, Hey, thanks for using my image. I'd be like, Hey, look, thief, <laughs> you, know, you stole <laughs> my image. You know, where's, don't you, you know, let's, let's talk offline to figure out how I'm going to move into your house, you know? <laughs> But that's up to everybody's energy input, right? Like, yeah. what's your return on your investment? I mean, I, I I know photographers that they just go after images that they think are fake or or composites, and they call them non composites. And I just don't have energy for that. So so for me, taking the high road or or looking at what you can get out of it, for me, I want to spend more time being creative. I'd rather spend more time figuring out a new lighting style. I would yeah. rather figure out you know the next iteration of Troy, what I'm going to do for sure, yeah. As opposed to going after somebody who used my image uh, in a blog post or a screensaver, yeah. But to qualify, if you are making money on it, that's that's a different that's a different conversation. Well, that's and that's that's a good that's a good segue into this part of the conversation because I wanted to talk about the law, right? And and you know, here in the U.S., I don't know what they say across the pond there, Jake, but here in the U.S., we. The Their courts, laws are better. They're, well, yeah, well, they're, but they're, we're known for saying <laughs> ignorance of the law is no defense of the law, right? So ignorance of someone, if someone's saying, you know, hey, you know what, this was a pretty picture I saw online. Yeah, I knew it was from Jake Hicks, but, you know, I didn't know I couldn't 
copy it and use it in these flyers that went out to 25,000 people for this club opening. You know, if if that's their defense, do you take the high road, as, as Troy Miller is indicating? You take the, the high road and you're like, you know what? You know, you even though you made money off of me, you didn't know, so I'm going to let it go this time. Or do you prosecute to the full extent of the law to get what's yours? And if you do, B, are you taking away from your creative energy and funneling, in, funneling it into this negativity of litigation? Jake Hicks, what do you say there? I think you need to be sensible with your time, yeah. And, uh, I mean, if, if anybody's interested, I've got countless of stories uh, of images being stolen repeatedly all over the world. And it's just not possible unless there was a dedicated team, in all fairness, to, um, you know, to chase them all down. And like Troy said, you just got to be you just got to be smart about which which ones you chase. If sure, I've had people use images on, you know, book covers and that sort of stuff without permission. And, yeah, you got to you got to chase that down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there are certain areas that you you just got to throw your hands up and go, that's out of my control. Like China, there's, there's companies in China that use my images wholesale to print on, you know, mugs and t-shirts and mouse pads and nothing you can do about it. You know, that, nope. that's, you know, that's just a, it's, it's just a no man's land of copyright. And, uh, and that's that. God. Um, so, you know, the, the, you know, you don't want to waste your time and energy trying to chase that because that's just, that's just not going to, result to anything but I, I do like i said before for me i really try hard to stay positive and focused on creating new work and worrying less about the old work sure if it comes across um that somebody's using it and they're making money from it then yes i do prosecute because i think i think you have to not only for yourself even if it's you know a few hundred bucks or whatever it is then you just got to educate people for the next next photographer not only have they stolen my image but they've taken a job away from another photographer that could have shot that book cover right so right i think you've got to you got to you, you just got to do it where you can but yeah be be, be smart with your time and, and, and being smart with your time means you i mean you can't spend all day hunting the web and and spend all your time in google search looking for images that may be yours and then hunting down the owners of the, the or not the owners of people that that stole the image both of you guys this is a question both of you how do you find the images online that are yours that may or may not have been infringed upon Troy, you want to take that first yeah um let me just comment to to what jake said before i mean i i totally agree you know one thing you asked about taking the high road and i think it's one of the things you have to do is you have to look at how can i instead of just getting all upset and mad and going after this book cover we'll just use that as an example yeah. right yeah that's a um, euphemism <laughs> yeah we'll go after it right but at the same time on your blog or in your post uh go hey you know, you got you want to learn how to do this or you want to let's let's do a podcast. Let's talk about this situation. So take advantage of that exposure. I mean, Microsoft did it when Microsoft Windows first came out. I mean, that thing was bootlegged 80 percent of the world. Right. But yeah. that also gave them saturation. That doesn't make it right. Doesn't mean they ignore yeah. it. But take advantage. I would argue that Photoshop did exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 So, take, so you I take would it, say that the, 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 the growth and size of Photoshop is down to piracy. <laughs> probably, yeah, because it was it was unaffordable, unattainable, and but everybody wanted it. And then once they created a model that you could access, it was already pervasive. So that's taking advantage of the exposure, but not letting the criminal go or the crime element. Yeah. Um, to, to find out if somebody's you know stealing your images, there's uh, sites like Pixie, P-I-X-S-Y. Uh, they do an amazing job where you sign up, you get an account, they will uh, go through your social media, your website, your Facebook, and they'll search for those images that you put out there. That's a good way to do it. There's also like TinEye and Google reverse image search um, that you can do. And uh, one of you guys mentioned last time the uh, the Google notifications, you mm -hmm. know, so you just see your name. Yeah, your Google. Yeah, I use the, yeah Jay, Google you, Alerts. you mentioned that you use you've been using Google Alerts for quite a while, right? Correct. Yeah, and that's that's mainly because uh, obviously Pixie and TinEye and the Google Image, you know, they 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 rely on images. So there, you know, we produce a lot of content that's not just images as well. So mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if I'm doing tutorials or articles and that sort of thing whatever it is then i do have google alerts set up for my name and my brand so that if somebody's using that or if anybody else uses it on the web then i i get told so i get it's, it's really easy it takes literally 30 seconds to set up and you know you just get an email each morning with you know this is where it's been used and this is what's been done with it so that usually picks up torrent sites and bits and pieces like that which obviously 
um, pixie and that sort of and that sort of thing won't won't find. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to switch gears a little bit now, and, and so we've talked about sort of finding the images or the content that's been infringed upon online. Once you find it and you've made the decision, like we've talked about, well, you got to make a call on if it's worth going after this person, or do you take a more of a high road and you know sort of leverage their exposure and make this a teach, teachable moment or whatever. But once you find it, what are the next steps? If you've decided, you know. Jake, why don't you take this? If you if you've decided, yes, I've been infringed upon. Someone stole stolen one of my images. They're clearly generating revenue from said image. What next? What do you do? What what's the next the next email you send? The next call you make after that happens? So, I mean, th there's a couple of ways you can go, uh, and and the opening shot can either go one of two ways from my point of view um and one of them is like oh hey i see you using my image on the on the you know, front cover da, 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 da. uh we need to talk about how to compensate me for that because obviously you are profiting from that image and, you know which is very you know it's non-offensive and you're just reaching out to them and uh you know on the rare off chance that they may have been ignorant um which is very unlikely yeah um yeah then uh then then obviously the, the other option is is just to you know cease and desist and then to uh, some people will reach out with them with a figure immediately like a huge figure just to scare them um into into action and uh, and then you just take it from there so literally so just sending that, an invoice do you do that yourself or do you do that through through uh, a lawyer um so pixie will will um, so Pixie takes, I think, I can't remember, is it 50% of it? Uh -huh. So, you, you know, if, if you don't have time to do it, then Pixie will will take on those cases for you. And and then, yeah, you just get 50% of whatever's um, of whatever they get. So if they deem the case winnable, then, yeah, that's that that's what you get. Or if you if you want to do it yourself, then you can do. But I rarely do. It's just such a time-consuming process that, yeah. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's like a referendum on humanity these days that the services like Pixie exist to, yeah, to, right. to Uberize <laughs> litigation. Right? Well, I think it's, I think part of it is, is, you know, I, I think that in general, like we understand the rules, but I don't think the majority do, you know, when, when this F64 live event that I just have, uh, had, I had a model image that we used in one of our emails. Well, I got a cease and desist letter from some, some event organizer telling me that I'm using their image without permission and that I need to stop using it. And I sent him an email and I, rep and I replied like, look, one, this image was provided by the model. Two, it's her image. She can do whatever she wants with it. You were not contracted. To f so I had to explain the law to him Jeez. because, you know, they're like, oh, well, there's a $5,000 fee associated with using our images. And I'm like, even the watermark on the image was another photographer that the model hired to take that shot of her. Mm -hmm. But because she was at this event, <clears throat> the organizer thought that, oh, it's I, I don't want you to use. The, they just came after me because they didn't want me using that image. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I changed the image because why not? Yeah. But they came at me as if I was the bad guy and I had to educate them. So I think there is uh, some misunderstanding in how this works. You know, the pervasiveness of free images or easy access images confuses people. Yeah, yeah, but that education. Oh yeah, piece if it's if it. it's on the internet, it's free mentality is is yeah. is dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's only being uh, exasperated by the younger generation as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but how do you, that, again, it's back to that picking your battles thing, right? I mean, if you're surrounded in a sea of idiots that, that and when I use, when I use the word idiot, I mean that are ignorant of the law, <laughs> which are idiots, right? Uh, but you're surrounded by a sea of idiots that are saying, hey, Google search oh, yeah. is the you world's know, biggest library. Oh, you, no. <laughs> you know, it's the world's biggest image library and it's all free. You just right click and save as. You know, well, do, you, do you spend your time educating or do you f spend your time fighting your way out of it? That's, that's, the, that's the question. You know, my daughter's a designer and she, she's a graphic designer. She works in, in the print industry and she works in very high end clientele, very high end. And the designers of some of those books send her images that are clearly they don't have the rights for these. They have to always go. Do you have the right for this image? Wow. Uh, we don't know why. What's a right? And this is this is coming from their designer. Yeah. So, 
Yes, there's no there's no excuse for ignorance of the law, but there's not enough people that know the law. Yeah. And so luckily, because, you know, she's grown up with with me in photography and understands that every single image in that book she's working on, I need a signed release for this image. Yeah. And you would it would it blows our minds how many times they don't even know where the image came from. <laughs> wow. OK. That's, that's... And photographers, photographers, the same thing. We had a book in the in the images. There were composites of of these particular graphics. And it turned out that those graphics that this person did not own that she was creating her composites with after the book is printed. Mm-hmm. So wow. the wow. <laughs> wow. This was. The yeah, see, that's life ruining stuff there. I mean, you know, we talk about we talk it, talk about it from the, the standpoint of the photographer being infringed upon. But what if your ignorance ruins your life, right? <laughs> so yeah. you decide, hey, here's an image. I'm going to use this great shot of this celebrity in my book. And you use it and you print it and they litigate against you and win for a million dollars. Right. And you don't have a million dollars. Your life is now altered for the rest of time. Right. So. Yeah, it, I mean, it pays to be, it, it pays to educate yourself, but at the same time, like you bring up, Troy, people may not even know that they need to be educated. They may not, they haven't had yeah. the benefit of growing up with a photographer dad or somebody that's in creative to tell them. So, but this, this particular show is not about those people, right? This show is about the people that willfully do it and that are intelligent. And they know the law, and yet they still do things, right, to, to break them. So against those people, Jake Hicks, I'll throw it over to you first. Against those people, when we've talked about, you know, finding your work, some of the first steps of action that you can do once you find that you've been infringed upon. But how do you, how do you protect yourself? What's the prophylactic towards these idiots? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I said it. I said it. Uh, <laughs> um, Did that draw well, a picture in your I head? I made one just yet. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so there's so, so there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, you know, obviously, obviously, the only surefire way of protecting yourself, the only way, is to not upload your images to the internet. That's the only way. Yeah, that's the only way you can protect yourself. Yeah. Coming down from that, you have different levels of protection. Uh, watermarking is one. Um, so you can watermark your images, mm-hmm. which is um, certainly popular. And the another way that I do is always embed metadata of my contact details and name and website and who owns the image and all that sort of stuff. And you can either do that at the camera level or it's, it's a very simple way of every image you import into Lightroom can embed all that data as well. Um, but yeah, beyond that, you know, you have the privilege of sharing your images with the entire world online. That comes at a bit of a cost, uh, you know, with, with regards to somebody could steal it. Yeah. Yeah. Trey, what about you? I mean, what, the, what are, what are the, uh, some protections that you can take to, you know, not get, not get infected by these people? <laughs> <laughs> You know, short of the the uh, suggestion you made, um, it's education, <laughs> yeah. right? It's just it's it, you need to educate people. You need to educate those around you when you can. And just like Jake said, you know, if you're going to put your image out there, just be aware it's going to be stolen. You just mm-hmm. don't put stuff out there you don't want to have stolen. And that kind of sucks because the industry or the community out there that's looking at that, they just don't know. So we can't change them. What we can help educate them through programs like this and, mm-hmm. and things that we do personally, we can help. That's a, that's a huge thing. Um, watermarking, that's not going to save you anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I watermark so people know what image, who, who made that image. Um, and that's what it's there for. Even if I've hung, hung images in galleries or, or uh, facilities, they may go look at that name and go, oh, who's, who's imagery concepts? You know, they'll go look that up. It's not going to protect it's, somebody. It's advertising, right? Right. But that's a, that's a good, it's a good point of education that we can take this opportunity to talk about because a lot of people think that by the mere fact of telling Lightroom or Capture One or whatever you're using to throw your watermark or copyright symbol, you know, option G, the year and your name, that now that image or that jumble of, of pixels is protected and you can litigate against it. Jake, I know there are differences between the law across the pond over in the UK and here in the US. What 
at what point does the image belong to the photographer um, over there once you once you once it's captured? Over here, as soon as as soon as the shutter is pressed, that that is then owned by the person who pressed the shutter. So uh, we don't have to register the image; uh, it's it, it's ours. Now, obviously, with litigation and bits and pieces like that, it, you can register it, and it becomes obviously more solid mm -hmm. uh, because well, who pressed the button? Can you prove who pressed the button? If somebody says, "Well, no, I pressed it," or "You pressed it," it's very you know, it, it, it's it's unlikely, but yes, mm -hmm. it, it becomes. After the fact, after you know it's been stolen, it becomes a lot harder to prove that it was yours to begin with. Um, so yeah, so you can register it, but yeah, legally it is as soon as you fire the trigger, that's it. You own it, and, and that's it. Yeah. It's like the. But what about the case? You remember what was it last year? A couple of years ago, there was the case of that bonobo. <laughs> that that, click, oh, yeah, that clicked the shutter yeah, and yeah. did a selfie of of him or her itself, mm -hmm. right? And there was a whole yeah. litigation of. Who does that image belong to? Does it belong to the to the animal? Does it belong to the person that owned the camera? Like you know, but that you, again, right? That's splitting hairs, literally, right? <laughs> right, right. And if you if you set a, an interval timer, does that mean that because Nikon made the interval timer, they own the image? Because technically, I didn't You're push right. the. I mean, like I might own the first image. It gets kind of it gets kind of funky. Think at some point you gotta you gotta sprinkle in a generous helping of common sense into this stuff and you know common come on. You, sense. You imagine that. that. <laughs> yeah, you you joke, but at the same time you need to be wary of contracts. Like you need to be wary of contracts with assistants on set as well. Mm, um, yep. Because like you know, obviously you're going to work with people that you trust and that sort of thing. But there are certain times where I am with the model doing things and I'm getting an assistant to press, press the shutter, for oh, example. So you oh, need wow. to be, you need to be, mind, you need to be mindful of that. You know, if I'm doing light painting or something like that, I'm creating the image during the exposure, but I'm not necessarily pressing the trigger. So yeah, you need to be, yeah, you need to be smart about it. Yeah. Oh, that's, so do you have a contract? Brilliant. Do you have a contract with your assistants that, that they, that they don't own those images are, I mean, like I, I, that never entered my mind before, but that's absolutely true. Right. Like you set it up and yeah. you know, you set up the shot. Yeah, so someone else presses the button, but you're like in, in the case of your light painting tutorial, you're in front of the camera doing your, your interpretive dance with light, you know, <laughs> whose image is it in the end? That's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, so usually there'll, there'll be a contract that is all encompassing with data created within that project. So that so that sort of covers it, you know, because, you know, as uh, you know, behind the scenes and all that stuff, you know, who owns that? And are they allowed to sell that behind the scenes? So you've got to be careful, you know, because behind the scenes has has value now. You know, it didn't used to. But oh, it yeah. Does have, it does have value now. So mm -hmm. if, if people are shooting behind the scenes images, who owns those legally? They're owned by the person who takes the picture but if it's of your project it's it's an extrapolation of nightmares so yeah these usually just an overarching project contract yeah. well bring it bringing it back to watermarking <laughs> there you guys remember there was this technology from adobe i don't know if it's still in photoshop but there was this technology that allowed for digital watermarking where there was this algorithm that would look at the pixels at multiple levels and and embed digitally your copyright info and no matter how the person cropped the image down to whatever size you're you're it would still be extractable and and i think part of the impetus for that was was law you know so that you could have an image and you could prove that it was real because it had this this digital invisible watermark in there do you a do you guys remember that and b is that a way to sort of save this state you know sort of prove ownership of an image what do you what do you guys think um I do remember it, and it's still around. It's uh, okay. uh, one of my one of my buddies uh, deals in some pretty high end stuff, and they they will embed this uh, digital uh, information in the image, and it's actually somehow you have to have the special app. It reads the image, it picks out the pixels. I, I have no idea how this thing works, but you duplicate it a thousand times, you can still scan it, and it pops up and says, "Oh, this is owned by you know Jake Hicks." Um, but you have to do it for each image individually. It's not it's mm -hmm. not cheap, and you have to register that image with that company. Yeah. So it's not as easy as it would be. It, it, we would like it to be, right? Like yeah. ideally, that would be perfect. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds ideal, but yeah, you're right. It's it's pretty it's pretty costly, I think. Yeah, to do it with huge huge numbers of images for sure. I mean, it's yeah. clearly a it's, it's this is clearly. I mean, there's a lot of 
you get tentacles on this issue and just being able to prove ownership of an image is one of the tentacles. And it seems like there's a convergence of technologies coming. Like if we have this big problem proving something is authentic and belongs to person A, don't we have technology that solves that now in blockchain and Bitcoin and, you know, those sorts of authentication technologies that are designed for financial transactions? Can't we apply those to digital image ownership? I don't know. I mean, am I reaching or is that science fiction? It's <clears throat> well, I mean, apart from owning the image, which I mean, you know, we can we can talk about who owns the image, but you also have to think about, uh, you know, just copying a section of the image. Like, where do we where do we draw the line on that? You know, with composites and and uh, that, that sort of thing. And you know, in the in, in the music industry, you know, you can sample and remix something till the end of time. And at what point does it become yours? And when do you stop paying that? You know, the people who were part of that, like. Their definition is it, it's like it's is it recognizable? Um, so that doesn't mm. define a section of time, but is it recognizable? Then, 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 yeah. And I think the same really ambiguous phrasing is also um, in photographic law that is it recognizable? Well, who's it recognizable to my mom, to me, <laughs> to you? It's, like, it's really ambiguous. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah, and it is it, it becomes tricky. It is very complicated because I was doing some research on this, and it says one in in the U.S. One of the laws is that if you switch medias, then it's then it's okay for interpretation. So if you take an image and you draw it or paint it or sculpt it, then you've changed the media, and therefore it's no longer a photograph. Now it's a sculpt. It's a sculpture, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that grays it even more. You know, it, this is this is discussions for lawyers mm -hmm. that have big budgets, right? Because this is very complex. Um, and I was listening to your guys' photo critique the other week, where you had somebody photograph a painting. Is that right? Do you remember that? It was a crop of a painting, right? I do remember that. Yeah. yeah, it was a mural, right? Yeah, yeah, remember that's, that's right. right. And, it was, and yep. it was, and it was, and it was in a public place. So that, so legally, he's allowed to take photographs in a public place, uh, but it's of somebody else's work. And like to me, when you guys were talking about it, to me that was that no, he's he's not allowed to sell that in any way mm -hmm. because that's theft. He's using somebody else's image to make money if he was to. But legally, I still don't know because did the public space pay that artist to own the right to that painting, and therefore, does anybody have the right to sell it? It's it becomes it's not just right, about the content right. where it was taken and who owns it. You know, after that, it's so many, yeah, so many loopholes. It's like buildings in public spaces that are private property, right? Parks, you can kind of get away with, but if it's private property, they can say, well, you can't use that image of that building because it's iconic and that's our brand, um, you know, but it's, it, it's in public view. So those things, those things that, that, that uh, you know, we can't change that, yeah, right? Like yeah. what? You know, well, there was a, a it was a huge case a couple of a few years ago, and uh, it was a you know a fine artist photographer that was going up into sky rise buildings and taking pictures across with a very you know very long lens um, into other apartment buildings and selling them like huge like massive wall yeah, prints that, yeah. of these of these and you know totally invading people's privacy, but he he wasn't breaking the law and he was making millions off them. Yeah, and he was they, doing these, he, these he had a gallery had, show. Yeah. Great. Right? He yeah, did a whole yeah. gallery show of of yeah. shots inside into people like peeping tom shots, but he was a high rise yeah. and there was no expectation of privacy because exactly. these people yeah. had their windows open or their blinds open and of course they were yeah. in full view of the outside, so there was no expectation he of privacy. He wasn't, you know, illegally in a place where to, you know, he was where he was allowed to be there and all that sort of stuff. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is that yeah. is so scary. So I wanted to I wanted to jump off into the uh, to the picks of the week segment and close this section off. But I wanted to get Troy. I wanted to get your thoughts on watermarking because you know I know Jake. You talked a little bit about how you know you are not so much anti watermarking, but you don't do it right for the most part. Troy, you watermark. I'm seeing watermarks on your your images. Where do you fall on that? Because there's there's and it's I don't think it's an easy answer or an easy question to answer because a, some people watermark, like you were saying before for advertorial advertising purposes, some people are misinformed about watermarking thinking if they slap that watermark on there, then they are, the image is somehow protected. And some people do it as part of the work itself to show that, Hey, 
this is a, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe piece of work and they'll strategically work the watermark into the image. What's what's the right way? I mean, I, is, is, is there a right answer to should I or shouldn't I watermark or should I get off the, the phone with you guys and go design <laughs> the perfect Frederick Van watermark to start putting on things? What do you think? Uh, I, I think with the pervasiveness of imagery today, I think it, it benefits you to put your name somewhere on that image. Not I, I'm not I'm not about putting it on there to keep you from copying it and using it because then I'm defacing my artwork. Right. Mm -hmm. But I would like you to know that it that I made it, that it that it came from me. Um and that's really the biggest thing. I mean, I've actually gotten work because of that. You know, mm. somebody has looked at an image hanging on a wall or maybe in, in, a, in a gallery somebody shared and went, oh, who's this spicy jello or who's this imagery concepts guy? And they look me up and they reach out to me. So that's that's what I'm all about. Whether you put your watermark on there or not doesn't give you any more rights to protection. Right. Um, right. It's just it's just, you know, you're putting your name on there. And, and I've seen some pretty hideous watermarks and I think it's it's bad for your image. Yeah, it just it's just like putting like I don't know. I don't know, buying Comic Sans. Comics signature. thank you. Thank you. Perfect. I was gonna say bad rims on a nice car, but you should remove that font from the universe. <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't care how amazing you and beautiful your photograph is, but if your watermark is in Comic Sans in the bottom right hand corner, I'm sorry. Get out. Man, just, get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get it. Forget about it. Forget about it. You're off the island. You're off the island. All right, well well uh, let's let's end this. There is one more thing that I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> and we touched on a little bit before, and that was the idea, like, Jake, you were talking about derivative works and copyright um, as it applies to someone taking your work and merging it with theirs, whether it be audio, whether it be cr cross-genre or whatever. Uh, Troy, I'll let you can, I know you have some thoughts on this. We talked about this in person a little bit when I was down there at F64, but the, the idea of someone being able to take your work and create something that arguably is larger than the sum of its parts, slap a price tag on it, sell it without even letting you know. Where do you fall on that? Is that fine, uh, you know, for these compositing artists? Or is is it breaking a moral law or is it breaking a physical real law? What do you think? I think it's both. I think it's breaking a moral law and a, and a physical law. This uh, idea that you're going to steal a part of an image, recognizable or not as a whole, is the same thing. It's plagiarism, right? You're stealing something and you're passing it off as your own. That's just unacceptable. It goes back to what kind of effort you want to put into going after that person. But I would say that if, if you feel the need to go steal somebody's work, go to a site that offers free images and just find something there. Le le but what, you where know, do you draw the line, so though, Troy? Well, where, anyway. where, do, where do you draw the line? Because, like, behind you, let me just put the camera on you. So behind you, there's the Enterprise, right? It's sitting there on your yeah. desktop. If somebody screenshots this video, and, and I know someone's going to do this, but they'll <laughs> screenshot this frame of you, and they take the Enterprise. I'm doing it now. And they, exactly. They make that Enterprise as part of a larger work, right? We should make that a contest on Twit Pro. <laughs> uh, but is that wrong? Is it wrong to do that? Or I mean, in other words, just to, you know, in all seriousness, what, how much of an image is it okay to steal or to None. borrow or to co-opt or is any of it? You know, it None. Really? So because like, not it, even one pixel. I mean, look, you, you, you look at the image behind Jake right there, yeah. right? Like, mm -hmm. like that location, that model, that angle on the handrail, where the lights reflecting, the choice of filters, the color of gel, the can he, he did everything. All of that, every pixel in there belongs to him. So yeah. taking taking any of it's wrong. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, I agree. But but that that is opinion in a court of law. What's wrong? Because you remember back in the day. You remember when all this sampling stuff was in the news, and that was back with uh, you remember Two Live Crew. Um, that was the, the first, one of the first rap groups to start sampling other works and incorporating it into their own. It's been rampant since then, obviously, but they were, they were in court for, you know, they were also the ones, I think they were the arbiters of the, 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 uh, parental guidance logo that you see <laughs> that started after two live crew. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, if you, if it's okay to sample two seconds of a song and use their riff as part of your song and you go on to make a gazillion dollars on it, do you have to pay the, the, the person that created the riff? And as it create, as it applies to us, 
you know, how many pixels does that represent before you need to be compensated? Jake, what do you, what do you think? To my knowledge, it is the, it, the, the law states it's recognizable. So if mm. we were to take that picture of Troy and we would just crop out a single doorknob or something back there, then it's unlikely to be recognizable. But that's only a small area. Mm -hmm. Maybe we were to take a larger area and it would be, you know, a chunk, like a huge piece of wood. That's totally unrecognizable, but it's a large area so it's not to do with the percentage of image or the size of the image it's it's whether it's recognizable or not is is where the line is drawn and that's the same in, in music as well mm -hmm. so you could play you know a five second riff and if it's not recognizable then it's fine but you could play like a two second of a really famous song and it would be like immediately that's recognizable interesting so, interesting. so like like for example in music um what was it ice ice baby from vanilla ice that riff that he had in there was dun 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 and, yeah. that, and that came from who is now that? Now you got to pay him. Now you got to pay now him. Now I got to pay. Just, yeah, oh, got a got a YouTube. Got banned. Yeah. <laughs> Don't sing Happy Birthday either. On the show. No, no, Happy yeah. Birthday is open now. Yeah. It's not, oh, is it's, it? Oh, okay. Yeah, no more copyright. Yeah, but but yeah, yeah, you're right, Jig. So so that that little ditty riff is recognizable. So he would be liable to pay for that versus not. So in in the case of of using Troy, so I could I could screenshot Troy. And I could use, say, just his ear in a work if I wanted to, or just that microphone or just part of the enterprise, and I'd be within my rights to use that in a derivative work, right? Let's just, you know, yeah. yeah, let's just be honest. It, it, if, if you That's feel the right. need, no, but if you feel the need to plagiarize somebody else's work, then, then you're not worthy. Yeah. Right. Go make your own work. I love Just go that. make your own stuff. Just, you know, all, all of this other conversation, that's for lawyers. Let yeah. them go figure it out. True. Let them go do that. Right. Like, but just the idea that I'm, I'm a creative, right? I sit here and I'm, I'm thinking, or, or Jake at one point decided, uh, God, how do I, you, you know, I want a different look in this. And he figured it out. Mm -hmm. Go do that for yourself. You know, don't don't rot on somebody else's coattails. Go write your own songs. Go grow your own trees. Go make your own pots. Whatever it is, just make go your do own your own web, stuff. Make your own WordPress website. Right? Yeah, <laughs> and if you can't if you can't do it, um, then just move on to something else. Right. Right. right? Like, right. I, yeah, I think well, that I think that that just for us, we're, as creatives, like we create stuff, we put a lot of effort into it. Um, I'm flattered that you like it. Yeah. But well you, you, you mentioned lawyers, right? And and I'll move on right after this, but this this is riveting television internet. <laughs> um but you mentioned lawyers and yeah, I, I think those are those are, are challenges for lawyers. That's what they go to school for to, to sort of challenge those ideas. But the other side of the coin is technology, right? So if you look at you know, I was watching this documentary that was talking about the deep fakes, you know, where and they actually demonstrated this where they had they took, I don't know, five or six photos of the president of the United States. And they were able to, through software algorithms, have another guy. They had a split screen president, another guy reading into a microphone. President is saying everything guy A was saying. And it looked you could tell. I mean, you know, I mean we because our brains are finely tuned to sort of see you know, humans and understand, you know, what, what muscles move and all that. But you could see that we they made that in 2017 in 2020, 2030, where will that kind of stuff be? Will this conversation be completely moot? Cause someone could say, you know what? I just bought the colored gel tutorial from Jake Hicks and I want to resell it, but I'm going to change all the models to something else. Now it's mine. Right. Can they can they do that? I mean, is that is that where we're going? You know, people being able to use algorithms and technology to make something their own and make it unrecognizable in the face of the law. And, you know, then what happens after that? What do you guys think? I think it's a bit of a rabbit hole when you start talking about almost AI creating something new, yeah, like who yeah. owns what the AI has created. It, I mean, that's, that's obviously, I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll be around to, to um, see that um, being dealt with, but I mean, that's terrifying at, at the same time mm -hmm. um, because yeah. it's certainly possible that something can be created by them, but um, who owns that is a completely different, different story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah. No, go ahead, we're at the cusp of a lot of new technology. Right. Like, look how old Facebook and Google Plus and Instagram and Twitter. They're not very old. 
Yeah. Right. So so a lot of the stuff we're talking about, these issues of plagiarism, um, websites and, st- and and songs and like that's just in this last decade, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so so I don't think that law and I don't think that um, people's understanding of the law have caught up with what's pervasive, you know, with the tech. Yeah. So this is this is the kind of thing where, you know, the laws are going to have to change as situations happen. Yeah. Um and, and who scary. knows? I mean, that's the Skynet world. I mean, luckily, you know, I, I, I always say, I think I mentioned this last night, that I feel like we were born too soon, you know, because all this cool stuff is coming. But in many ways, I think we were born at just the right time <laughs> because yeah. all this cool stuff is coming. I want to cash out just before the AI <laughs> start shooting it, you know. <laughs> when, when AI start designing AIs, that's when it's time to go. <laughs> That's for right. to pack it in. It's time to pack it in because now you're just cattle or a battery, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and okay. then suppositories become something different then. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Just oh, let man. Just you in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, guys, I want to I want to uh, move on. We're just about at the end of the show here, but I wanted to give you guys a chance to share with the TWIP audience your picks of the week. Um, Jake, for your edification, the picks of the week is a segment where you, the co-host, can recommend anything to the TWIP audience as long as it is somehow – even tangentially related to photography. It could be a workshop, could be a technique, could be a mindset, could be software, hardware, whatever. So, Jake Hicks, I'm going to throw it to you first as your first time on This Week in Photo. What is your pick of the week? Well, seeing as I'm new here and I don't know any better, I'm just going to jump straight in with self, self-promotion, I'm afraid. And, yeah, I said uh, anything. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we spoke about it at the start, but this this week we've just released a brand new long exposure portraits tutorial that I did with RGG EDU. Um, yeah, like I, said, like I said before, really proud of this one. And it, it, it covers, in my mind, everything to do with long exposure, especially in this studio. Um, I personally don't think and I haven't seen anything out there that has been done to this um, level of detail and, and, and depth uh, with regards to long exposure. Yeah. And like I said before, I think it's something that we've all played with. We all know what long exposure is, but we've never really sort of dug into it and and really maybe perhaps refined it to a point where we would be happy to sell that commercially. You know, it seems so random and so, you know, it's a lot of fun. But at the same time, how can we sort of get a bit more control over it? And I go through how we can do that and mixing ambient light and flashlight in the same image and create something that is not only unique, but very commercial in its, in its polished look, you know. Fantastic. And that's that's where – what's the URL where people can go find that? Uh, hopefully, we can pop that in the show notes, but it's on the RGG EDU website. Yeah, it's the newest tutorial. It's yeah, it's being advertised. Like I said, it's just, just came out this week. So, yeah, and that's Long Exposure Portraits. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. See, that one's so hard. You know, your very first pick of the week, it was easy, right? Yeah, talking about myself. It's easy. Exactly. <laughs> Next time you're on, yeah, you got to pick something yeah. new. So. <laughs> All right. Troy Miller, man, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is the amazing macro. Um, you know, we look at macro lenses as being, you know, close up only, you know, bugs, water drops, yep. <clears throat> ice, little things like that. But uh, the, the macro lens is an amazing portrait lens as well. You know, they're, they're, they're designed to be really, really sharp. They're super flat edge to edge. Uh, and they're a good focal length for doing mm-hmm. portraits. Yep. Um, I started shooting it for portraits at weddings and I realized it was awesome because I could step back and do a three quarter. Then I could step in and I could do, you know, a, a, a facial profile. Then I could step in and I could do eyelashes and I could step in and I could do, you know, just the ring on the hands. And that range of work is pretty amazing, you know? So, uh, if you got a macro in the bag, pull it out, try it for some portraits and something else other than, just photographing those little tiny things. Yeah. I love it. See? Yeah, it's good. It's good it. lens. I love it. Macro macro lenses. Any particular focal length? Um, I know you're full frame. You're a full frame Nikon shooter. So what, which one do you have? I have a one. I think it's the Nikon's a 105, 120 or 105. Um, I like that. I like that length. Uh, but there's like anywhere from like 80 to any, any focal length that's good for portrait. You know, let's just say like 80 to 200 is going to be good. You know, it's just how far back you want to stand in, depending on what you're photographing. Cool. And, you know, it just it just occurred to me, Jake, I, I think I remember you saying that you you shoot Nikon as well. Is that right? I am. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Are you uh, yeah. are you enamored or put off by the new Nikon Z? What is it? Z six and six Z7? and seven. 
uh, I'll just preface it by saying that I am blown away by my current D850, um, yeah. and that's I yeah that's that's more than enough for what I need. I stepped up from the D600, D610, and uh, yeah the um the the this this new camera is just out of this world for what I do in terms of the color range. Um, so the new, I mean, obviously the new iteration, Nikon are horrendous at marketing and advertising themselves. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, You're too it's, kind it's with that. Almost is almost painful, really. It's mm-hmm. disgraceful. In, in, um, but um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm not somebody who jumps on board with the latest thing at all. I, I'm not. I'm not a gearhead. Uh, I, I'm obviously I'm very in, into my lighting and that sort of thing. But yeah. uh, for me, it's yeah. I run all my gear into the ground, so it'll be a long time before I invest in a in, in a mirrorless. And I wouldn't invest in the first model anyway. I would yeah. give them chance to uh, shake out the bugs, as it were. Yeah, yeah, and and that's uh, that's in stark contrast to our other guest who ordered one already. <laughs> who, I'm nice. sorry, okay. who okay. ordered two of them already? Right. So for the folks that may not have watched our Nikon show, try, genuinely but, interested to know, you know, what, you know, as to what was the what was the main you know, what was the core thing that said, I need that? Yeah. Um, I have a full Sony kit. I have three uh-huh. Sony mirrorless <clears throat> and oh, I have one, my. I have one converted to infrared. Um, okay. and the reason is so I can see through the live viewfinder. That was my whole goal for, for using that. Um, and so now it's nice cause I can switch and use all my glass cause I have, I have a significant collection of glass. So that's, that was my core is I can, I can, uh, not carry two giant bags. Like if I go somewhere and take the Sony and all the lenses, now I can just take a Nikon and my normal <clears throat> camera kit and I have all my Nikon glass. So I'm super excited about it. And I have the D850 as well, and I have a D5. So knowing that the the chip on the Z7 is similar to that of the D850, I, I'm I'm super stoked because that's that's an amazing sensor. So I agree. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I I tested both the Fuji and the Sony against it. You know, shot for shot in in the studio with color and and that yeah that Nikon sensor was just out of this world color wise for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think I think. You know, since Troy pulled the trigger for two of them already, did you buy two identical models or the six and the seven? No, I ordered the Z7 uh, kit with the 24 to 70, and I ordered the Z6. So the Z6 is going to come out a month later. Mm-hmm. So that one uh, will probably be my color body, and then the the 45 megapixel, the Z7, will be my infrared because I'll shoot that mostly okay. uh, for like okay. landscapes and stuff like that. But so you'll, you got to have be, a color one. You'll be the the canary in the coal mine for the Nikon. Yeah, community of quit, right? I have. Uh, I'm happy to. I have always bought the first Nikon body. I've had every D1, D1X, D2, D2X. I've had every oh, single wow. one down the line, and I've 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 been impressed by every single one. Yeah, so, even even after that keynote, you're you're okay with it. Well, yeah, you know the keynote was ridiculous, but <laughs> the, the the engineers make an amazing camera. They do. So yeah, you know, you've got to look. Look past it. I know it's yeah. crazy. It's so sad. It's yeah, like, yeah. But do. it's just consistently bad. Like, how can that be? You have to try. It's been years. <laughs> it's been years. And it's Different not like you can't that. look at other brands, even outside of the camera industry, and see how did they do it. Let's do it like that. You know. I know. Yeah, I know. but who knows? All right, guys, we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Thanks to you both. Really heartfelt thanks for coming on again. We uh, again, I sort of alluded to it earlier, but we tried to do a show last night, a live stream a and rehearsal. for a confluence of unfortunate events, uh, the show didn't work. Right. And, and basically we're here again and you guys made time in your schedules to redo the show. And I, cause I think this was a very important topic. I think we covered most of the things that I wanted to cover. So thank you both for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, Jake Hicks, if people want to keep up with you, we mentioned rggedu.com for the tutorials. Where else online do you hang out that people can go stalk you? So all of my work is on jakehicksphotography.com, and then everything can be found from there. So, yeah, there's, there's, as soon as you get on there, you'll, you'll see uh, all of my work. And uh, down at the bottom, there's all my links to my Facebook and the Instagram and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, just just head there, and you'll, and you'll find, find what you need. Awesome. Very cool. And Troy Miller, what about you? If people want to stalk you online, where should they go? Uh, SpicyJello.com or SpicyJello on Instagram. You can you can find everything from there. All right, very cool. All right, once again, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we'll see you next time. And TWIP listeners, you know what time it is. It is time to take that lens cap. 
。好。This is Twitter.